Hello again, everyone. This is Gene Ahrensberg coming to you on Sunday, April 28th, 2013. This week, gold recovered about $56 net to a $14.60 handle. Silver clawed back a net $0.86 cents to $24.10 on the cash market, and shell-shocked mining shares ended the week still in the penalty box or bomb shelter, but mostly green. You know, there's been a good measure of trouble if this Texan is quoting Shakespeare. But to start this video off in context of what just happened in the gold market, the Goldman smash, running of the technical stops, and the irrational panic that followed, let's look at one very important chart. At first glance, this is a busy, complicated looking chart, but it tells a very simple story. Again, in the interest of time, we are going to assume you already know all about Fibonacci theory, repetitive retrace zones, and why so many technical traders today pay attention to Fibonacci theory. The Texas English version is that traders pay attention to the Fibonacci zones because they often define the limits of trends, of advances, and corrections in the movement of securities prices. One thing we want to point out on this chart, and we think it's pretty darn important, is that the most recent smash of gold, where highly leveraged paper gold futures fell from $1,560 at the Thursday, April 11 close to 1351 on Monday, April 15th, a record $209 bone-shattering plunge over a two-day trading period on a closing basis, while that seemingly brutal collapse put the fear of God into just about anybody who was unhedged, leveraged long, one derivative or another, what that chart is telling us, friends, is that the plunge we all just endured is, wait for it, normal. In the world of securities and trading, it's extremely rare for a market to advance uninterrupted without a significant correction for 12 years. There may have been a market that did so without a major correction, but if there has been, we haven't studied it. It's almost as rare for a market to advance for 12 years with only one significant correction when viewed on a long-term monthly chart such as this one, but that's exactly what gold did. For all its sound and fury, when viewed in context of the entire gold bull market since 2002, this current correction in gold has merely come close to testing the first generally accepted level of expected retrenchment in the Fibonacci world, the 38.2% retrace zone. Gold's intraday low of $1,321 in the wee hours here of April 16th got to within a $50 bill of the actual 38.2% retrace level of $1,294. Call it $1,300, that's close enough for a bullseye. And if the Fibonacci self-appointed guardians, the purists out there who send us emails and insist that we use only the activity which has occurred since the last important correction in 2008, then this correction has only come very close to testing the 50% Fibonacci retrace level, which wouldn't you know it, comes in very close to that same $1,300 level. And if we look back to that previous major retrenchment for the gold bull market, during the Great Panic of 2008, when the world thought the global banking system might implode, there was a rush for liquidity then, and it sent even gold hurtling lower, down from roughly $1,000 to $681. Turns out that correction was also normal in Fibonacci terms. It ended sort of between the 38.2% and 50% retrace levels then, as the world digested the Lehman collapse. After 12 years and only one prior material swoon in the 2008 rush to liquidity, gold was overdue for a good old-fashioned cascade correction. And it got one, didn't it? For the record, paper gold sold off about $600 since its $1,923 intraday pinnacle in September 2011, having tested the 1320s in the panic plunge April 16th. That's a 31% downer, and a third of it came in just two days in a blowout panic and capitulation. At least it sure looks like a capitulation, and as you can see, it tested the Fibonacci 38.2% level, almost tested it, that is. So gold, which had gotten ahead of itself in September of 2011 and ended the peak in a parabolic short-covering surge may have just 
we think, completed uh, its mirror image of that parabolic collapse and capitulation to the downside. What could be more symmetric than a parabolic peak ending in a parabolic bottom? And if we're right about the last move being capitulation, then gold should leave only limited opportunities for bulls to get back in as it corrects the excess bearishness such a plunge causes for the vast majority of unhedged gamers and short-term investors. If the massive demand for physical gold worldwide is any guide, the correction for gold has not had the kind of effect that one might have thought, where a rapidly falling price would strike fear in the hearts of mankind and panic selling of their physical gold. Instead, we have seen the exact opposite, humongous demand, as all of you no doubt already know. There's a good reason for that. It's because the factors which underpin this gold bull market have not changed. If anything, they've gotten worse, or better, depending on your point of view. We don't think the gold bull market story is ending here in 2013, but it has been correcting the surge to $1,923. In kind of a COT triage today, I'm going to pick a few of the most interesting, most telling, or most unusual COT charts and just dive into them for the sub for subscribers. Because of the nature of the COT markets and the amount of ground we want to cover in a short time, we're forced to assume that all of you already know the basics behind these COT charts. Those new to the Got Gold Report coverage might review previous videos on YouTube or the subscriber video section for a kind of primer as to who the players are and what they normally do. Put the word normally in quotes this time. The charts we're about to review tell a compelling story, probably one of the most compelling, most interesting setups we have ever seen in the Commodity Futures Trading Commission Commitments of Traders Reports. To set the stage, this is the Finviz gold chart in hourly terms. As gold was clawing its way back up from the vicious Goldman smash, April 12 to April 15, the COT week is noted on the chart and notice that the New York close on Tuesday came at what was actually pretty close to the trading high for the week this week, about $1,412. It's important to keep that in context and so remember that everything we're going to see in the COT charts is as of that COT cutoff. Gold has continued its bounce since then but none of the activity after Tuesday will show in these data. And with that said, let's jump right to the first graph of interest in the CFTC Disaggregated Commitments of Traders Report, or COT. This is our usual one-week recap of the positioning of the largest traders of gold and silver futures. We're going to keep it simple here and just point out that in gold, what we can see is that as gold was recovering $45 from Tuesday to Tuesday, we have the most unusual circumstance of the usual hedgers on the buy side in a big way, with the speculators having assumed the role of gold sellers. If that's not crystal clear, let's say it another way. As gold was moving higher, the largest commercial hedgers were very strongly reducing their collective net short positioning while the big speculators were selling into the rally. That's something new and it underscores a kind of sea change that has overtaken the paper gold market at, at least temporarily. In essence what this table is telling us is that we have the natural hedgers in a hurry to reduce exposure to the downside in gold but the speculators are apparently convinced gold has not yet probed its ultimate bottom. Part of that is because of the nature of the different groups of traders and we don't have time to, today to go into it in depth, but generally speaking, the specs, the speculators, are trend followers and think relatively short term while the hedgers are mostly hedging their exposure to the gold price. What this table tells us is that the big hedgers, covering their hedges in big numbers even as gold was rising, are more fearful that gold will go higher than lower. We know this because it's their business to put on hedges to protect their inventory and exposure from falling prices. The fact that they seem to be in a hurry to reduce short exposure, exposure tells us that they are less worried that gold will fall further. This table also tells us that the trend followers were motivated by the gold smash to increase their short positioning, also in a material way, 
with gold now far below its popular moving averages, that's not surprising. In a moment, we'll look at graphs which tell us how their positioning stacks up against the only other significant gold correction which moves so far below the moving averages, and what it might mean for all of us looking ahead. As we just saw in the table, the producer merchants, including bullion banks, covered or offset a big 23,308 lots, or 32 percent of their already quite small remaining net short positioning to show an extremely low 50,062 contracts net short, the lowest number of net hedges for the natural hedges of gold since September 16, 2008. The week we learned that grossly overleveraged Lehman Brothers was going down, when the producer merchants then held only 27,386 contracts net short, still the DCOT record low number of producer merchant hedges. The producer merchants and bullion banks are considered the largest, best funded, and because they make markets for much of the gold trade worldwide, they're considered the best informed traders of gold and gold futures on the planet. Since their net positioning is a negative number, because the hedgers are always net short, the higher that blue line goes means a lower net hedge position, or fewer net short bets in other words. As of the close on April 23rd, with gold then clawing higher at $1,412, best informed traders of gold futures are at their least net short position since the very worst days in the 2008 panic, when gold had been sold off to around $700 in a rush to liquidity then. In other words, the producer merchants have only been less worried that gold would fall further in price as the Lehman collapse was playing out on national TV and around the world. In the remote event that that's not crystal clear, the big hedgers are not positioned as though they believe gold will cut new lows and instead were furiously covering short bets over the past COT week. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're right but it does open a window into their longer-term thinking. They think gold has already marked a bottom, in other words. Let's move on to the next graph. This is the producer-merchant graph for just their short positions. You know, people tend to think in terms of the big hedgers as being monopurpose, but they are actually a diverse group of people who hedge both long and short, for different reasons. By looking just at their short positions, we can gauge how much of their positioning is protection against a fall in the price of gold, as opposed to those hedging against a rise in the price of gold. There's both. Here we can easily see that the producer merchants, including bullion banks, showing 118,500 shorts, have gotten down to the lowest gross short position since November 18, 2008, when they then had just 102,803 shorts as gold changed hands in the 730s during the 2008 panic. While we're here, notice please that if the producer merchants, which includes the positioning of bullion banks, thought that a gold smash was coming before April 12th, then they sure as hell didn't get into position for it in advance. So for all those out there blaming the usual suspects and bullion banks out of habit, well, we can say that the data just does not back up that notion one bit. In a moment we'll look at a class of traders that certainly did get into position for the smash, but the producer merchants ain't them. Now, this is the graph of the traders the CFTC classes as manage money. Trend following traders, hedge funds, commodity trading advisors, people who operate commodity pools, and other large traders who trade futures on behalf of clients, which we shorten to just say the funds. Notice that as of April 23, the trend following funds are still reporting near their least net long positioning since the 2008 panic, and they actually decreased their position this week by 15,743 lots to just 52,191 contracts net long. There's an important reason for that which we will cover in a moment. But first, notice, please, that notwithstanding this past, past two weeks breakdown, important lows in the managed money net long positioning have tended to correspond with important turning lows for the price of gold. Now, as we mentioned in the last video, which, by the way, is available on YouTube even for non-subscribers, this net position graph 
kind of makes it look like the funds have been selling off their long gold contracts. But even during this smash, the funds long contracts never dropped below 113,000 contracts. For comparison, during the terrible 2008 period, their long contracts plunged to as few as 62,000, then with gold having been hammered to $700. They've held on to their longs, in other words, but this next graph tells us why their net long positioning had gotten so unusually low, and we think it also points an accusing finger at the benefactors of the sell stop raid, which peaked April 15th, just a few days after Goldman Sachs, Jeff Curry put out his now infamous sell gold call. This is the graph for just the managed money short positions. Managed money, or the funds, built up an extremely high short position of over 60,000 COMEX contracts prior to the Goldman and Investment Bank and Hedge Fund gold smash April 15th. That's the reason their net long position is at such a low level, not because they've been dumping their long contracts. And if they can, the largest spec funds will try to catch stale or tired, vulnerable longs leaning the wrong way, or maybe too heavily one way. Say, for example, short the Japanese yen and long gold, and teach them all a valuable lesson in Hedge 101. Don't get complacent and don't trade without stops. Period. And don't think Mr. Blank Fine, Mr. Curry, and company didn't have a dog in the gold smash hunt this time. This chart says they did. And not only did, but they advertised it far and wide, telling people they thought gold had more downside to sell out of gold and even to short gold as of April the 8th, after gold had already corrected back to long-term support. Goldman has since announced that they've covered their short bet on gold at or near $1,400, booking a quick profit, if you believe that story. But look at the graph and see what it is telling us for the COT week. Instead of taking advantage of the gold smash to cover their shorts, the funds added 12718 to their shorts as of Tuesday, as gold had recovered $45. Let me repeat that. They sold into the rally for gold, meaning that as of Tuesday, the funds believe that gold is not yet done moving lower. In their trend-following world, it seems the correct thing to do, apparently. If something is working, do more of it until it quits working. That's the modus operandi of a trend-following hedgy. Even when the big hedgers and the bullion banks are furiously covering their shorts, the funds were selling into their buying. For most of this bull market, the funds have been on the long side of the gold trade. They've been the buyers. The gold world has temporarily been turned upside down, in other words. The COT for both gold and silver have lots of extremes, record positioning, and downright out of whack positioning this COT week. But we only have so much time to devote to this video, and you only have so much precious time to view it. So. Out of time triage, we'll cover one more gold position before jumping to this week's conclusion. This is the net positioning of the paper gold futures traders who trade under the reporting limits, the little guys of the futures world, the class the CFTC calls non-reportables. That's most of us smaller gamers. How about that? As gold recovered $45 this week, the little guys of the COMEX bourse dumped 12,914 lots, which is 99% are all but 133 lots of their already very low net long positioning to the lowest net long position in DCOT history. Since the great gold bull market began, there has been a consistent correlation to extreme lows in the small trader net long positioning and important turning lows for the price of gold, as we show here. That does not mean that the smaller traders are all collectively wrong at the turning points. Some are right and some are wrong. And out of fairness, we said the very same thing in the recent commentary before the gold smash, because the little guys were already at a low level of net longness then. The point we want to emphasize is that important turning lows for the price of gold often correspond with important lows for the small trader net long positioning. And as of April 23, 
they had reached record territory in terms of the lowest ever net long position of just 133 lots net long in large measure because of this next graph. This is the graph for the smaller trader gross short positioning and as you might expect it shows that the smaller traders are also at a record number of short bets on gold futures. At 39,735 short contracts as of April 23, the little guys held a few more short contracts than their previous peak in short bets, which was on October 6, 2009, when they reported 39,618 short contracts, with gold then $1,041. But maybe what most of you might not have expected to see with gold recovering $45 this COT week and with the producer merchants and swap dealers both seemingly covering as many of their net short bets as they could, like their big fund brethren, the smaller non-reportables actually added to their short bets this week to the tune of just under 7,000 contracts to get to that record high short position. The little guys are short-term thinking trend-following traders too as the graph and their positioning shows clearly. Well we've covered a lot of ground in a short time so let's summarize what we've talked about today. As bad and scary as the recent smash for gold seemed to all of us in real time, looking at it from 30,000 feet the correction is not only normal in Fibonacci terms, if we consider it in context of the entire gold bull market to date, gold hasn't quite reached the first regular Fibonacci level of 38.2% near $1,300, but it sure came close, fetching up in the 1320s. This is only the second major correction for gold in 12 years in fibonacci -dom, which tells us a lot about the underlying fundamental factors which support the gold price in fiat currency terms. Gold was overdue for correction. It had too many people leaning in the same direction, too many people who were unhedged and overconfident and that was just too juicy a target for the hedge fund sharks who can move markets with their own trading and by jawboning it when it's vulnerable. We may have just witnessed a parabolic downside blowout following the parabolic blow-off peak in September 2011 and if so that is a symmetric conclusion of the correction in a spectacular way. The sell-down triggered extremely heavy buying of the real deal physical metal on the street worldwide, forcing premiums much higher and resulting in delivery delays or even shop closures due to lack of inventory as widely reported. The normal changes we would expect from the largest traders have been temporarily turned upside down with the producer merchants very strongly reducing their net shorts while the funds and the little guys are actually selling into the gold rally. The natural hedgers, including bullion banks, are in a big hurry to reduce their hedges with gold at or below $1,400. They have only been less worried about gold moving lower once during the Lehman collapse week in 2008. And if the producer merchants had any inkling that the long-term support for gold in the 1520s would give way, they did not get into position for it in advance. Managed money, or the funds, on the other hand, are within spitting distance of their lowest net long positioning, and as the graph of their gross short positioning shows, they certainly did get into position for a gold, uh, make that a Goldman smash ahead of time, with Jeff Curry leading the verbal charge to push it over the very well played but clearly manufactured cliff. Recall they were adding new shorts into this week's rally for gold. Talk about momentum. Meanwhile, smaller traders of futures have gotten the gold sell down religion. They're at their lowest DCOT record low net long position, and they got there by this next graph. They got there by adding pretty heavily into the nascent gold rally this week, adding short positions up to a new record high number of short contracts. We have to conclude that the COT remains very imbalanced and so it remains dangerous for both sides of the contest. Over the short term most anything is possible. Traders are sh shell-shocked and nervous but when we see the big hedgers in a New York hurry to cover their net hedges as gold was rising and when we see the smaller traders blown out of the long side of gold entirely and within 133 lots of being net short, 
we have to conclude that the COT is screaming to us a story of enormous imbalance and now the most contrary bullish we have ever seen it, better even than in December of 2008. With the funds holding nearly 70,000 spec short contracts, the smaller traders on the hook for another, call it, 40,000 shorts, and with swap dealers holding another 98,000 shorts, and all or nearly all of those shorts having to be covered at some point, because none of them actually have gold metal to deliver into those speculative 21 million ounces, or call it $31 billion worth of phantom gold. Well, it may sound a little Pollyanna, especially right after the Goldman Gold Smash, but at some point there's going to be one heck of a short covering rally, and the good news is that as of this week, we have not seen even the first sign of it. Even with gold having recovered as much as $140 from the intraday lows set on April 16th, near $1,321. The markets teach us not to get arrogant, not to get complacent, not to rely on past performance or on all kinds of other portfolio killing habits. No one can see the future. No one knows what the price of gold will do over the short term just ahead. But from where we sit here in Texas, we have never seen a more bullish setup for the gold COT in a contrary sense. This week it actually got more bullish, even with gold advancing. As subscribers know, we re-entered gold as shown on the gold charts, because nothing we, we have seen alters our longer term bullish bias for gold, and our sense is that this past two weeks will end up being seen as the as at least the beginning of a selling climax, if not the whole lock, stock, and barrel. And if we're wrong or premature, we will certainly rely on the one thing we can count on to get us out of trouble or preserve a profitable trade no matter what, friends and fellow vultures. Our trading stops. And as we always say, mind your stops because trading futures without stops is like extreme skydiving without a parachute as Mr. Baumgartner is about to do here. Without stops or a parachute, the chances for a bad outcome from trading or skydiving are strongly increased. Well, that's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching and we'll see you all again next time. for now.